Okay. Um, everybody, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar, The Ecology and Conservation of Bumblebees. This is um, being presented for our Bumblebee Atlas volunteers. If you're not currently a Bumblebee Atlas volunteer and you've joined us, you are very welcome to stick around. Um, anybody is welcome here. But we put this event on annually for our Bumblebee Atlas volunteers. My name is Rich Hatfield. I'm a senior conservation biologist for the Xerces Society and uh, lead our bumblebee conservation programs, which currently means running or coordinating these bumblebee atlas projects in 20 states across the country from the Pacific all the way to the Atlantic. We really appreciate you being here and spending your Saturday morning or afternoon, depending on where <laughs> you're situated with us. And uh, we've got a dream team of folks presenting this material to you this morning and are really happy that you're here. Before we officially get started, I just want to give you a bit of a Zoom orientation. At the bottom of your screen, most likely, depending on how you have it all set up or what device you're joining us on, you should see a few different options. There should be a chat option in there. You're welcome to share comments or reactions or thank yous or interact with other volunteers. You can select who you're um, interacting with by selecting that blue button and changing who you're actually chatting with. Um, you, If you have a question that you would like addressed or answered live, either um, while people are typing, I'm sorry, while people are presenting, if you have a question and you'd like to have it answered live, Either one of our conservation biologists will answer that question or potentially will uh, direct that question live during our question and answer periods this morning. Um, you're all welcome to put questions in the chat as well, but with the number of people that are joining us this morning, we're just unlikely to be able to monitor that, but we're able to closely look at that Q&A um, in the, in the Q&A box. So if you have a question that you'd like to have answered, please use the Q&A at the bottom. If you need closed captioning, there should be an option for that as well at the bottom. So at the bottom, you should see a CC. If you click CC, um, you should see options for automatic closed captioning in there. I would ask that this morning that you, or this afternoon, again, depending on where you are, that you try to avoid using the raised hand button um, unless you're really having some sort of uh, major issue that you need help with. That raise hand button just makes flashes on the screen for those of us that are presenting, and it can be a little bit distracting. So I would ask that you refrain from using that. Just to get this out of the way up front, we are recording this webinar. We will post the answers, or um, not the answers, we will post the recording to the Xerces Society YouTube channel. So stay tuned there and know that you can watch this presentation again later. Um, it probably should be up within the next couple of weeks. With that, I'm going to turn it over to the folks that are going to be presenting this morning. I will join you at the end of the webinar to give you an orientation of our new website, which we're launching for the Bumblebee Atlas very shortly. Um, I'm going to start and let Elaine Evans introduce herself. Hello everyone, my name is Elaine Evans. I am an extension educator and researcher at the University of Minnesota. I'm based in the Department of Entomology and um, I do a, a work helping to coordinate the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas as well as just doing a lot of different pollinator education and research into, into bee conservation overall. And I am just going to, to pass off to Katie. Oh, wait, not Katie, Leaf. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, <Trick. everyone. laughs> I'm, I'm Leaf Richardson. Uh, I'm a conservation biologist with the Xerces Society. And um, I uh, have been working on bees for some time. I specialize on bumblebees. And I lead the California Bumblebee Atlas, and I'm based in Riverside, California, in Southern California. Um, so I'm excited to be here with you today. And I will pass it off to Elise. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Elise Bernstein. I also work out of the University of Minnesota. I'm a re researcher and the outreach coordinator for the University of Minnesota B Squad, which is the outreach and education arm of the B Lab. Um, that's part of the Department of Entomology at the University of Minnesota. Um, I do work on the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas um, and do some bumblebee research, as well as lots of pollinator outreach and education work. Um, and I will pass it over to Jenny. Hello everyone, super excited to be here with you today. My name is Jenny Pajesic. I am a conservation biologist with the Xerces Society and one of the coordinators of the Bumblebee Atlas in the Midwest. I am based in St. Paul, Minnesota, but I work in Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, and Nebraska. And I will pass it on to Lori. Hi everyone, I'm Lori Heyman. I'm also a conservation biologist with Xerces. I head up the Southeast Bumblebee Atlas, which is North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Tennessee. And I'm talking you, to you today from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And I think now I pass it on to Katie. Yeah, hi everyone, my name is Katie Lamke. I am a coordinator with Jenny and Elise and Elaine. Um, running Atlas projects in North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri. Um, there's a lot of us out here working on it. It's a great time. I'm based in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I'm going to be starting off the presentation for us today. So if anybody hasn't heard of the Xerces Society before, we're a science-based nonprofit organization that works to conserve invertebrates as well as the habitat that they need to survive. We were founded in 1971, and the organization is named after the Xerces blue butterfly, which was the first butterfly known to go extinct from human causes. Um, we have staff all over the United States, and some of us are working on getting habitat on the ground. Some of us work to conserve endangered species. Some people are keeping up to date with pesticide impacts. Um, others are doing education, outreach, advocacy work. So we're sort of coming to conserve pollinators from all different um, perspectives. And we are a donor supported organization. So thank you to all of the members that are tuning in today and helping us do this important work. Um, if by the end of the webinar, you're super jazzed about bumblebees and wanna keep supporting this mission, go ahead and go to xerces.org slash donate. And there are multiple ways that you can support the organization or become a member yourself. And Xerces focuses on invertebrates because they make up about 95% of the biodiversity that's on earth. So when you think about all the different kinds of mammals or birds or plants or fungi, all the different types of living creatures, 95% of those different species are some type of invertebrate. So they exist in nearly all ecosystems and only about 2% of them are pests, so the rest of them are beneficial to humans or are important parts of a food web. They're helping with biocontrol, decomposition, providing pollination services. They're filling all of these different roles within the environment. And there have been recent figures that have estimated there's about 200 million insects per human on this planet. So there's lots of insects doing lots of different things. So it's important for us to make sure that they have a safe place as we move into the future. So this morning or this afternoon, um, I'm just going to start with a brief introduction to pollinators in general. And then the rest of the crew here is going to dive into more detail specifically on bumblebees. But this is just going to orient you to where bumblebees fit in the, the group of pollinators. So first, obviously, is that they provide pollination services. So it's a huge, huge role of transferring pollen grains and helping plants to reproduce. So when we think about natural areas or even our urban garden areas, agricultural areas, we know that diversity is important. It helps create a healthy ecosystem. All the different plants are helping to cycle nutrients in the soil, provide soil stability, filter water, the vegetation above ground is helping to sequester carbon, provide habitat. And so it's important to keep these um, diverse plant communities sort of maintained and pollinators have a huge role in that. But their services sort of extend beyond just helping the plants reproduce, right? Those plants are also a valuable food resource for 
all kinds of wildlife from songbirds to small mammals to large mammals to reptiles. Um, it's been said that about one quarter of bird and mammal diets consist of fruits or seeds that pollinators were needed to produce. So the pollinators themselves are helping pollinate those plants to make the seeds, but they're also a food source themselves. So you see here on the slide, there's this chickadee with a caterpillar in its mouth. Um, about 96% of songbirds will rear their young on some kind of invertebrates, and it was found that a pair of chickadees has to collect about 10,000 caterpillars in order to feed their young. So the pollinators themselves are a huge source um, of nutrients to different animals. And then lastly is habitat, right? The pollinator habitat is compatible with the needs of a lot of other wildlife. So the plants are providing food, but those plants are also providing shelter. And then lastly, um, thinking about plant diversity once more, about 85% of flowering plants known on earth require some type of animal for pollination. And that animal is usually an insect, right? So for this reason, and for the reasons that I've listed on the past couple of slides, is why we consider pollinators to be keystone species. That's an organism that has a disproportionately large role in its environment. So if we think about removing bees from the environment, this earth would look and function a lot differently than we know it to be today. So our main groups of insect pollinators include all of these that you see on the slide here, butterflies, flies, moths, wasps, beetles, bees. They're all doing some sort of work, but the bees are the most efficient pollinator, and that's for a few different reasons. One is that they're the only insect to actually consume both nectar and pollen as adults and larvae. So throughout the entire life cycle of a bee, they're really dependent on those floral resources. And because of that, they've evolved these really neat physical structures that allow them to collect and transport pollen pretty efficiently. So on the hind leg of this bumblebee here, you can see that there's sort of a shiny triangular area. Um, that's what we call a corbicula or a pollen basket. It's essentially a grooved out area on the hind leg that's framed with these really long hairs and the bee will actually collect pollen and sort of store it there while she's out on a foraging trip. So on this slide here, you can see is another bumblebee with a very, 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 very full pollen basket. That is a huge pollen load. It's kind of like she's carrying all of her groceries in on one trip by just packing all that pollen there. Um, and the last thing that helps make a pollinator effective, or I'm sorry, a bee, one of the most effective pollinators, is their tendency to do a behavior called flower constancy, which is you know, when a bee is presented with different types of flowers in the environment, as they're going on a single foraging bout, they're going to visit the same type of flower. So let's say there's roses out, maybe there's daisies out, and maybe there's, I don't know, a mint out. The bee is going to choose to just forage on the roses. And this is good for her because she's avoiding wasting any handling time. So flowers have different structures. And in order to access those nectar and pollen resources, the bee has to learn how to manipulate the flower correctly. So by visiting the same type of flower, the bee is knocking down any time that she has to spend learning that flower. This is also beneficial to the plants because the bee is collecting and depositing the necessary pollen. So there are many, 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 many kinds of bees. Um, this slide here just showcases a few of the beautiful creatures that we call bees. Um, hopefully from this slide, you're gonna take away if you don't already know that there are many more kinds of bees than just the honeybee or the bumblebee. There's actually about 20,000 species worldwide. Uh, 5,200 in North America, and about 3,600 are native to the U.S. So here on this pie chart here, you don't have to try and fully digest this. Um, this is by the University of Minnesota Bee Lab, sort of representing the diversity of wild bees in the United States. And typically when we're categorizing wild bees or putting them into groups, it comes down to a few different things here that are on the slide. 
So one is the way that they collect pollen. So different bees have evolved different strategies for collecting pollen. Some will collect it on their hind legs, some will collect it under their abdomen, some will collect it sort of in their crop internally and sort of make it a liquid mixture. Um, we also look at the tongue link. There's long tongue bees, short tongue bees, medium tongue bees, that they can all access different types of resources from different flowers. Um, <clears throat> we also think about life history traits. So a big one is whether they nest above ground or below ground, if they're stem nesters or cavity nesters, meaning they might nest in a rodent burrow um, <clears throat> or maybe some rotting wood. Most of the bees nest below ground. I think it's like 70% nest below ground. Um, something else that comes into wild bees is our sociality. And, you know, we can think about bees as being social, like it's a case system, there's a queen, there's workers, there's males, there's a hive, all the way to solitary where there's only a single female who is creating that nest, laying those eggs, provisioning the nest. Um, but then there's a whole spectrum in between. There are some bees that are semi-social, there are some bees that are maybe solitary, but they nest together in an aggregate. So lots of different ways. Um, Jenny's going to talk more about that um, in a little bit. And let's see, did I miss anything on here? Oh yeah, their diet. So there are specialist bees and generalist bees, meaning like the, the types of flowers that a bee might go and collect pollen from. Some of them have a very narrow diet. They'll only be collecting pollen from a few different kinds of plants versus a generalist which a bumblebee is considered a generalist. It will forage from many different types of plants to collect all different kinds of pollen. So as we go on today, we're really gonna be focusing on a small sliver of wild bees. So as you can see here, the yellow sliver up top represents bumblebees. So only about one and a half percent of all the bees in the US that are native are actually bumblebees. So when we look at bumblebee diversity here, the map is showing where you can find the most different kinds of bumblebees. So anywhere that is red means there's a, a lot of different kinds of bumblebees. And you can see those red areas sort of follow mountain ranges. So along the Sierras and the Cascades and the Rocky Mountains, and there's a little blip in the Black Hills of South Dakota. That's where we find the most species of bumblebees in an area. Um, each state or region that's listed out here are where there are current bumblebee atlas projects or where they will be starting this year and the number of species that have been historically found there. So you can see it kind of varies, you know, if you're in the Pacific Northwest or California, you're going to have a lot more species to learn than if you're in Kansas or Missouri where there's a little, a little less. And when we look at bumblebees sort of separate from other wild bees, there's a few things that kind of make them stand out as a really good, efficient pollinator. And one of those things is their physiology. So bumblebees are a relatively large bee, right? So they have pretty large muscles in their body. And because of that, they're able to use those to essentially generate heat by shivering. So this allows them to fly in cooler conditions or wetter conditions where a lot of our other pollinators can't. So, you know, they have a longer foraging day because they could start earlier in the morning and be out later in the evening. They're also pretty intelligent creatures and we've likely only scratched the surface in this area here, but there's a really cool video. Maybe somebody can drop the link to the video in the chat. Um, we're not going to be able to show it today, but it essentially shows that bumblebees can learn to roll these balls to access a reward. And when the balls are placed at different distances from where they're trying to go, the bee chooses the shortest distance to get the reward. It's a really cool video. Um, hopefully you get a chance to watch that. I didn't hear that. It was a mistake, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, tongue length. So bumblebees are a long tongue species. So this means they can access resources from a wide variety of plants here. So if we think about a plant like bee balm or monarda that has sort of a longer tube to it, the bees can actually use their long tongue to extend that in and gather the nectar. Um, and lastly is innovation and strength. So again, the size of a bumblebee, it's relatively large. 
they're able to access plants that other pollinators might not be able to because they're too small or not strong enough. They don't have enough weight to them. So like this bottle gentian on the slide here, the bumblebees are able to pry that flower open, get inside and extract the resources that she needs. Um, other flowers like many flowers in the pea family, like the Baptisia or a clover that sort of has a rigid lip to it. I don't know how many people know about flower structure here, but some flowers need a little bit of weight to be pushed down in order to gather the pollen. So pretty cool to watch bumblebees fly around and visit different flowers. Um, the last thing that they're able to do is bug pollinate. So this is a gif here of <clears throat> some sort of nightshade plant like a tomato or a pepper. And the yellow tubes that you're looking at are anthers or the male part of the plant that hold the pollen grains. So these anthers are holding the pollen grains very tightly. And in order for them to be dislodged, they need to be vibrated at a pretty high frequency. So what the bumblebee is doing is she's gripping on to those anthers, using her flight muscles to generate a vibration that's going to dislodge the pollen grains so she can collect those. So if you look really closely, there looks to be some powdered sugar or something coming out of the tip of the yellow. And those are all little pollen grains. <clears throat> um, about 8% of plants can benefit from this. And not every single bee can do this, right? Bumblebees can, honeybees cannot. There's a few other wild bees that are able to buzz pollinate. And it's pretty fun if you have peppers or tomatoes in your backyard or some other nightshade if you are able to observe this happening because they actually make a different sound when they're buzz pollinating. You can tell that they're actually doing the act. Um, you know, and most people don't think of tomatoes as needing pollinators because they can self-pollinate, but it's been shown that when pollinated, they can actually produce more fruit. So that's why garden centers will sometimes sell tuning forks so that you can go out and sonicate your plants and hopefully get some more produce. So pretty cool behavior. Hopefully you get a chance to see it. And I'm going to pass it off to Jenny now. Thanks, Katie. I'm just going to, oh, um, Katie, I actually cannot share my screen. Okay, thanks. All right, so next we are going to be covering the bumblebee life cycle, um, primarily focusing on the social phase of the life cycle. Oh, oops. Sorry guys, I think I'm having some technical difficulties. Can you all see that? Looks good to me, Jenny. Okay. Um, is it moving forward? No. Okay. I had to click on the actual, are you in Google Slides? I am. Okay. Huh. All right. So I think I should be good now. I apologize for that, everyone. Yep, it's working. All right. So. We are going to be covering the bumblebee life cycle nest, and we're going to be focusing primarily on the social phase of the life cycle. So as Katie mentioned, bumblebees are social insects, which means that they live in colonies. Uh, bumblebee colonies are founded by a single queen every spring, and all of the individuals in the colony are actually related to each other. So the workers, the drones, are all the offspring of that founding queen bumblebee. These colonies can be quite large. Some may reach up to a thousand individuals in a single colony, and they all work cooperatively together to produce new queens and drones at the end of the year. 
In temperate regions, bumblebees generally have an annual life cycle. Uh, so the queens emerge in the springtime and then the colony lasts basically a growing season and then it expires at the end of the year. Because bumblebee, bumblebees need a lot of space to produce their colonies, uh, they need to find a cavity somewhere where they can establish their colonies. So that will often be in the hollow of a log or in a rodent burrow. They need a large space uh, to shelter themselves during this um, what, uh, as a colony. Okay. Bumblebees actually spend the first four to six weeks of their lives in, in their colonies. Um, they need to develop from eggs into adults. And their stages of development are actually really similar to those of butterflies. A butterfly, you know, a hatches, uh, caterpillar hatches from an egg, and then it metamorphosizes into an adult butterfly. Bumblebees have really similar developmental stages. So queen bumblebees will lay eggs uh, on a food source, uh, basically a little lump of pollen and nectar mixed together. Uh, once those eggs hatch, they develop into larvae, uh, and then they are fed by the worker bumblebees in the colony or by the queen. And once the larva has grown enough, it basically spins a cocoon, similar to the way a butterfly would spin a cocoon. And then it metamorphosizes into a adult. So this is the pupil stage. So instead of looking like a little worm, it is developing its adult body, it develops its eyes, its legs, its wings. Uh, and then once it emerges from this pupil stage, it is an adult bee. So once it's emerged as an adult, what it does next is dependent on its cast. So we have several different castes within a bumblebee colony. We have the queen bumblebees, which are those reproductive females that establish colonies. Um, we have workers, which are non-reproductive females that help the queen bumblebee in the day-to-day -day activities of the colony. Uh, larger workers are the workers that are responsible for foraging activities. So those are the, the individuals that are leaving the nest and foraging on flowers and bringing back food to the nest site. The smaller workers are responsible for in-colony tasks. So they are helping the queen, queen, queen care for brood. They're cleaning the nest site. Um, and then the drones are the male individuals in the colony. So these are also reproductive individuals, uh, but they don't really assist with any tasks at all. Their major responsibility is just to go out and to mate and to spread the genetics of that colony. So, for the female individuals in the colony, what caste they belong to basically just depends on how much they eat when they're developing. So queen bumblebees eat quite a bit of food when they are uh, developing and they become quite large. They're very large bodied individuals. And then workers are smaller. They eat less as they're developing. Larger workers eat a bit more, smaller workers eat a bit less. Uh, but their, their body size is basically determined during those developmental stages of their lives. All right. So drones differ from female bees genetically. So what determines whether or not a male or a, uh, or a bee becomes a male or a female bee is genetic. Drones basically have half the genetic material that a female bumblebee has. Drones are actually produced from unfertilized eggs, so they only have one set of chromosomes. Um, so even unmated bees can produce drones if they would like to. So sometimes you'll have some of the larger workers producing male eggs, uh, which will develop into drones in a colony if they're being a little bit sneaky. So just to give you guys a visual of what a bumblebee colony looks like. I'm gonna play a short video. 
Right, so you can see that very large individual in the center of the nest, that is the queen. And then you can see some smaller individuals, those are the worker bees helping her out. As you can see, the colony is quite messy looking. Um, that brood comb uh, is basically just a pile of food uh, on which eggs are laid. As I mentioned previously, bumblebees have an annual life cycle, um, which starts um, when the, uh, or I apologize. Um, so bumblebees have an, an annual life cycle. So if we think about what bumblebees are doing right now, um, in a lot of the United States, the queens are still overwintering in the soil. So bumblebees tend to overwinter around six, two to six centimeters below the soil uh, under the ground because they can't handle being out in the cold. Uh, but once the temperatures start to warm up a bit more uh, and we are more in the full swing of spring, the bees will emerge from hibernation and they will start to forage. So bumblebee queens need to eat pollen and nectar in order to develop their ovaries. Uh, and once their ovaries are, are developed, they can establish a colony. So they also need to locate a site to start their colony. Um, as I mentioned previously, they're cavity nesters. So they need a large cavity in which they can uh, start their colonies. So that might be a hollow log or a rodent burrow or something similar, a similar space. Once she's found a location in which she can start her colony, she will collect pollen and nectar, form it into a little ball and lay eggs on that. And that will be her very first cohort of workers. Um, once her first cohort of workers emerges later in the summer, uh, the queen will no longer leave the nest site. She will stay in the nest for the remainder of her life just focusing on laying eggs and caring for brood, where the larger workers will take on the responsibilities of foraging. And the colony will grow through the summertime uh, until it reaches a switch point sometime in the late summer or early fall. So the colony will switch into reproduction. So instead of producing more workers, they will start producing new queens and new drones, the reproductive individuals of the colony. The new queens and drones will uh, leave the nest and they will find a play, or they will leave the nest site and then they will mate. And then the new queens will find a location to overwinter, whereas the rest of the individuals in the colony will all expire. So everybody in the colony except the new queens dies uh, before the onset of winter. The timing of these events can vary a lot between different species of bumblebees. Some species of bumblebees will emerge earlier in the springtime. Some will emerge a little bit later, but in temperate regions, generally, this is what their life cycle looks like. There is one group of bumblebees that is an exception, the cuckoo bumblebees. So these bees emerge a bit later than most bumblebees. and Instead of establishing their own colonies, what they do is they usurp a colony of uh, a different bumblebee species and they trick the workers into rearing their brood for them. So a cuckoo bumblebee will look for a already established colony. Uh, so she'll spend some time searching for, for a nest. Uh, and then once she finds that nest site, she will basically sneak in to the colony uh, and wait a few days so that she can take on the scent of the original bumblebee colony. And then she will fight the original queen to the death. Um, and once she's done that, she can trick the workers because she has that colony scent. 
into rearing her brood for her. Cuckoo bumblebees uh, are basically built for battle. They have really large heads, they have large mandibles, uh, and they also have a really thick exoskeleton, which protects them when they're, they're fighting with the original queen of the nest that they're usurping. Uh, and they also have a very strong stinger. If you've seen a cuckoo bumblebee, they have almost like a wicked curve to their abdomens. Um, and they are, they, they look like they are ready to fight. Uh, that doesn't mean necessarily that the bumblebee nest uh, or the original bumblebee queen is completely defenseless. If the colony is large enough, they will be a lot better at defending their nest from intruders. Uh, so they can sting the cuckoo bumblebee to death. Uh, and some bumblebee species also engage in a, a defensive behavior known as honey dabbing when they sense an intruder. And so rather than fight with the intruder, they will run up to them and basically just regurgitate nectar onto them and they get so sticky that they can't fight them anymore. Uh, so some really interesting defensive behaviors from bumblebees to try to protect their nest. Because as I mentioned previously, all of the workers in a colony are related. It's in their best interest to uh, help their sisters produce offspring rather than to work for the cuckoo bumblebee who is not related to them. All right, and I am going to pass it off to Elaine. All right, uh, let's see if I can work out this technology. All right, so I am going to be talking about um, bumblebee behaviors and interactions. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of different things that I could be talking about. What I am going to focus on today are a, a set of behaviors and interactions that um, we're interested in as scientists. And also these are ones that you might be able to, to view when you're out um, doing your surveys, out looking at bumblebees, or if you're generally out in nature, these are things that would be great if you could keep your eyes out for and make notes so there are options um, when you're submitting observations to add, um, add other information with your observation um, with information like if you if you do see mating behavior or overwintering behavior, if you see parasites or predators, we'll be talking more about uh, what to look for through this section. But I'm going to be talking about foraging, about nests, mating and overwintering, parasites and predators, um, with the idea that these are are um, give you give you some ideas about what to look for out there. People talk about bumblebees being a generalist forager. So I wanted to explain a little bit about what that means. So bumblebees um, are able to visit and digest pollen from a lot of different kinds of plants. There are uh, another set of bees that people talk about being specialists. So these specialist bees are only able to digest particular pollen types. So those specialist bees are really dependent on particular flowers for their food sources. Bumblebees as generalists are able to, to um, you know, physically digest and get nutrition from a lot of different types of flowers. But this doesn't mean that they just will visit anything. So even though they are generalists, there are certain flowers that bumblebees are often associated with. So if you look at things like bee balm or Dutchman's breeches, um, those are a couple examples of, of, of flowers where we, we tend to see a lot of bumblebees on those flowers. On the plant side of things, there are also some flowers that are dependent on bumblebees. Katie had mentioned with bumblebees large size that they um, there are some flowers that um, their large size helps them kind of get into these flowers. So the closed bottle gentian is an example of this, where bumblebees are um, tend to be the, the only ones that are strong enough to kind of pry the, the petals open. These petals never open fully. They get in there and pollinate 
um, those those flowers are are really dependent on bumblebees. And um, seasonally, there's there's other flowers that bloom in early spring that that really need those queen bumblebees. So even though they're they're generalists. They do have associations with particular flowers, and that doesn't mean that there's not some flowers that are dependent on bumblebees in general. One of the things that uh, is, is a big, big thing people talk about for bumblebees and looking at how they're using flowers is their tongue length. Compared to other types of bees, bumblebees all are called long-tongued bees, but then within bumblebees, we divide them up into short, medium, and long-tongued bumblebees. So within bumblebees, their, their tongue length can vary from 5 to 12 millimeters. And one of the things, um, one of the, the, the um, evolutionary pressures that is behind this variability is uh, competition at flowers. So bumblebees with, with different tongue lengths tend to use, use different kinds of um, different flowers with different kind of tube lengths, different access to the nectar, and that can help reduce competition between bumblebee species. Um, and this has found to be a trait that that is pretty malleable, even in the short term. So even over the period of of um, 10, 15 years, they've seen um, tongue length be, be something that was adapting um, in response to warmer climate, where where plants were um, were having this response, and the bumblebees were actually showing um, shorter tongue lengths just in that um, kind of shorter period of time. So in general, it makes sense um, that that bumblebees with the long tongues are going to go to to these deep flowers, and bumblebees with short tongues are going to go to shorter flowers, and um, and so you can see how this how um, the bees with long tongues would be able to to reach nectar up at the end of a tube or inside of deep flowers. And um, you might think, like, why, why not all have long tongues? Like, if you if you need the long tongue to reach the, the deep nectar, uh, that seems like a big advantage to be able to access that nectar. Why wouldn't all bumblebees just have long tongues? But they've actually showed that um, there are differences in efficiency. So long tongue bees that are trying to access nectar from from shorter tube flowers, it's actually they have more tongue to maneuver, and it um, is um, decreases their efficiency. So it is more efficient to have these these different tongue lengths that are associated with the the different lengths of the flower tubes. There is a, a workaround that that some bees do. So um, some short, shorter tongued bees will do something called nectar robbing. So these bees will um, will cut a base, um, cut a hole towards the the bottom of those longer tubed flowers. And then they they stick their tongue in there and they're able to get to that nectar without having to try to go, through the regular entrance. They can use um, holes that have been made previously by other bees. As part of this, they do bypass pollen collection. So um, they're, they're not being the greatest pollinators this way, but um, this is a rusty patch bumblebee that is nectar robbing and um, they are, um, you know, not all bees do this behavior, but um, rusty patch bumblebees are, are known for being, uh, being nectar robbers. Moving on to, um, to nest related behavior. So the, the first um, nest related behavior that you might be able to observe out there is nest searching by queens in the spring. So this is a behavior that you'll see um, after queens are emerging from hibernation, when they're looking for nests, they you can um, often see them flying low to the ground and doing the, these zigzag curvy patterns 
um, around as they're exploring areas. You may also see them, them stop, kind of explore down. Um, they might, they, there might be a, a rodent nest that they're detecting. They might just be checking out a, a clump of leaves, but you can see them stop go down, um, crawl down, and, and um, see if they, if they like the area. And this is a really interesting behavior because it helps us um, learn more about what kind of habitat that, um, that, that queen bumblebees are looking for. So if you see this behavior, it's really interesting to note, um, you know, kind of when you're seeing the behavior so we can know uh, phenologically what the, what the pattern is and also what kind of habitat you're seeing them, them do this behavior in. Um, oftentimes I, I see them doing this in kind of the woodland edges or in woodland areas. Um, in, in areas that do have some, some um, leaves and other things um, built up on the ground. You can also sometimes find established nests. So um, these you can, can run into um, and you can notice them just from noticing bees flying, flying in and out is the way that we usually find, um, find these nests. And if you do find a nest, um, getting the, the location of, of where that nest is, sharing it on Bumblebee Watch, getting a photo of at least one of the bees so we can, can learn, um, you know, associate that nest with the species, as well as um, finding out what's going on in the surrounding habitat. And the photos I'm sharing here are a couple of examples where, um, where there, there are some species where we really need to learn a lot more about their nesting. So the, the picture on the left is actually a rusty patch bumblebee nest that the a homeowner reported. And um, we were able to go and gather all kinds of really great information about um, what was going on with those bees. The, the photo on the right was a, a really deep bumblebee nest that um, it was a bombus impatiens nest, which we know as the common Eastern bumblebee, we know more about their nesting in general, but still um, it was fun to, to have enough people helping to dig down the five feet down underground that this, um, that this nest was to just uh, see what they were doing. So, so sharing these locations of nests can help inform the scientific community about what's going on. And um, you can gather information, but we, you will also be, may be able to connect with, with scientists who are interested in collecting more. Another behavior you might see out there is mating behavior. So different species of bumblebees have different colony cycles. So you can see this from kind of midsummer to the fall. Um, there are a lot of colonies out there that may not survive to the point where they're producing males and queens. But um, when they do, the new queens will, will forage for a little bit, going back and forth to the nest, building up fat reserves um, to help them survive through the winter. Males will eventually leave the nest and um, generally do not return. So um, oftentimes when they're when they're mating, they'll they'll stay engaged for um, a long period of time. So sometimes um, it's not too rare to to find uh, couples of bees and be to be able to observe the mating behavior happening. There are um, some times when the, the queens are just super attractive and there will be lots of males that end up glomming onto the queen. So this was um, a, a spot where I, I think there were six males that were all um, climbing up on top. So they're not all, all successfully mating, but, um, but it does make it easier to find when there, when there are um, so many bees all gathered together. There are different strategies that the males have for finding queens. So one of them is perching behavior. And these are, um, if you're, you're looking at bumblebee males, you'll notice that some males have really big eyes. And these tend to be males that do this perching behavior where they get a spot that they stake out. They keep an eye out for, for bees that are coming through the area. And they'll, like this male is doing, they'll, they'll fly off. Um, to explore and chase and, and see what's happening. Um, if they see a, a 
queen that's coming through they will will fly over and grab her they will also um, chase males away uh, this is a behavior that you that you may see um, you may have these males kind of um, chasing you if you if you get too close to them so here in this video you can see uh, another bee that just flew by in the background and the male is is taking off to, to chase that bee not all males do this perching behavior. There are other males that do what's called cradle robbing. So these males will um, find a, a, a nest in the, in the area and just hang out near the, the entrance of the nest. So this one, this video is a little hard to see, but basically there are, there's a, a nest in there and there are a bunch of males just kind of hanging out in the leaves here waiting for for bees to emerge and then they um, fly around chasing them there are other males that um, produce th that make scent trails so they will um, have scents that they leave on plants that are attractive to the queens and that's how they um, they connect with with the queens for mating so this is something that um, that we are still gathering, trying to gather information about from that rusty patch bumblebee nest that that the homeowner had told about us about. We were able to observe the nest. We were able to make one observation of of mating near that nest. We currently have no um, there's no documentation of of what strategy rusty patch bumblebees use for mating, but we did see males hanging out near the nest we did see a male grab um, grab a queen as it was coming out of the nest so one point of of data for rusty patch bumblebees being cradle robbers um, and many points for the value of, of finding nest observing nests sharing information about nests with the scientific community so we can can put more information together Another thing we are trying to gather more information about is um, bumblebees that are overwintering. Where are they overwintering? This is a big question mark for a lot of species. Here is a, a common eastern bumblebee, Bombus impatiens, digging themselves down in the ground. We, what we know is that for most bumblebees, they're digging themselves about two inches in the ground, usually in loose soil. They, um, they don't have uh, really great digging arms, but they, they make do with what they have and can definitely um, do a better job of it when it's loose soil. Tends to be on north facing slopes. Um, we don't have great information about habitat associations. So um, sometimes it's in, in wooded areas, sometimes not. Um, we don't have specifics for a lot of different species and we don't know a lot about survival rates. So observations of overwintering are, are really helpful for um, helping us just get all these little pieces of information put together. I also wanted to mention predators and parasites. So there are um, a lot of different things that are um, eating bumblebees. We're still learning more about the phenology and the frequency of these different things, um, but we have parasites like flies, wasps, nematodes, and, and internal mites in bumblebees. There's also mammals, birds, spiders, flies, bugs that are, are predators, um, kind of eating, eating the whole thing. There are um, some predators that, and parasites that you can look for at or near flowers. So when bees are, bumblebees are going to flowers, sometimes they are grabbed by these ambush bugs or crab spiders. The crab spiders are really good at blending in. They actually can change color to, to match with the flower that they're on. There are parasites that will um, lay their eggs on the bees when they are at flowers. So watching out for canopid flies that are landing on bumblebees as they're foraging. There are also these robber flies. Um, sometimes we get reports of people who say, I saw a bee eating another bee. And these robber flies are also great bumblebee mimics but they are actually predators who will go around and grab bees and, and eat them. 
There are also some predators that are focused more on the nest. So things like skunks can show up at nests. They can um, claw and open up the hole. They can um, eat bunches of foragers, brood. Sometimes they don't eat everything. They leave a kind of a little weak nest there um, that's uncovered. Um, you know, bumblebees like to be covered up. But um, but um, learning more about, about who's there, what they're doing. If you see a nest and it looks like it's out in the open, um, might have been something like this. I also wanted to quickly mention um, there's a lot of observations of mites that are on bumblebees. So um, especially in the, on the, in the spr in, uh, spring on queens, they can be kind of covered in mites. Those external mites are generally harmless. They are thought to just be hitchhikers. They do eat some pollen and detritus. Sometimes they, they end up in the nest, but there are, um, there are internal parasites, internal mites that bumblebees have. There's lots of other diseases and information that we need about that. That's harder for you to observe while you're out. Um, a lot of those need either microscope or molecular work to be able to detect. So um, the, the information that you can, can gather while you're out there. These kind of miscellaneous things can help us to fill in some gaps, but even though there's a lot we know about bumblebees, there's still a lot we don't know. So there's a lot we have to still learn about nesting biology for a lot of species, that um, hibernation habitat, queen and male dispersal, so understanding how far they move from the nest, getting really good information about population densities, reproductive strategies, Male bumblebees are really kind of um, an, an, uh, an understudied group within the bumblebees where, where there's, we have a lot more to learn about, about what they're doing. And um, by gathering information about these things, um, we can hopefully start to piece together population impacts of threats and stressors, which are um, which is kind of the, the what we're really hoping to learn to help with bumblebee conservation and keep our bumblebees thriving in the future. And with that, I think we can, um, I'm done. <laughs> Great, thanks Elaine and Katie and Jenny for giving us an overview of bumblebee ecology. There are, a whole host of questions that have popped up, as you would probably expect. Um, I would encourage folks to go to the Q&A box, and there should be an answered tab in there. And you can see that our team has been typing answers to a lot of those questions in there. So you should see a lot of answers to questions. There are a few we've sort of earmarked to talk about live. So I'll throw a couple of those out here now. One of them that I thought was interesting, and anyone can feel free to jump in and answer this, but that we didn't fully cover there was, do all bumblebee species finish their nest in late summer, early fall, or do some finish their nest earlier? Does someone want to tackle that question? I can handle that one because I covered the life cycle. Um, so that's a great question. Uh, the timing, or as we would say in science, the phenology of those life history events definitely varies between different species of bumblebee, uh, and it is also dependent on the weather. So some bumblebee colonies may finish up earlier in the summer time. Uh, in the Midwestern United States, the two-spotted bumblebee is a species of bumblebee that has a pretty short colony cycle, and they usually wrap up reproduction uh, before the fall starts. Um, we also have species that have longer colony cycles. So the common eastern bumblebee is a really long-lived bumblebee species. It doesn't wrap up reproduction until the fall. Sometimes I will even see bumblebee drones out in October um, out here. So super different timing there. Uh, it really It really just depends on the species. And then in if the weather is quite warm in the springtime, sometimes we'll see a slight shift in the phenology of colonies. So 
uh, colony might get started a little bit earlier than it normally would if we've had a really warm spring because the queens have emerged earlier and everything has just gotten going a little bit earlier. So it's both dependent on weather uh, conditions as well as the species of bumblebee that you're looking at. Great. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I'm going to launch a poll right now, which is just uh, for us to gather where folks are joining us from. So while we're answering questions, if folks could just answer the questions in the poll here, there's just two quick questions, maybe just one, um, depending on where you're joining us from. I'm going to launch that right now. Um, another question that was flagged to answer live was, has climate change affected the life cycle, especially since we are having more variation in the beginning and end of seasons? I expect we'll get into this a little bit in the next conservation section that we're jumping into, but does someone want to just jump in and give a couple of quick thoughts about that? I could, I could answer that one. Um, yes, the short answer is yes. As with lots of other organisms, plants and many um, invertebrate and vertebrate animals, we know that uh, bumblebees are being affected by climate change already. So for example, there is evidence that uh, climate change is causing a shift in the ranges of bumblebees where for any given species, they seem to be disappearing from the hottest places that they used to occur in. So generally the Southern margin of their range if we're in the Northern hemisphere, but they are failing to move northward into areas that may now be suitable for them that weren't in the past. Second, um, they're being pushed slowly uphill, and we see a real coherent signal of this in the in the collections data. So the average population of a given species is now found higher on the mountain than it was 50 years ago. And so for some species that are already alpine specialists, uh, they have nowhere to go. And so we expect that climate change is going to cause some local extirpations. Climate warming and associated weather stuff like drought is also having strong impacts on the physiology of bumblebees, on the timing of their life history events. Um, similar to what Jenny referenced, um, they're having a mismatch with the, the host plants. There are many other physiological effects that have been reported um, as, a, as a function of climate warming and climate change in general. Great, thanks Lee. Um, very interesting. And then one last question here. Um, do you know how long it takes for a queen to start a colony? How many days from site selection and egg laying until she has some help? Someone want to dive in and answer that? So we there there's uh, things we don't know and things we do know as usual. <laughs> so we know that um, it's about three weeks from egg to adult for um, from when the queen first lays an egg to when she'll have workers that are out. And so um, typically during that, that um, three weeks, the queen is still has to go out and forage and bring back food for her developing larvae. Um, that three weeks varies depending on, on temperature a bit. Um, and usually, um, you know, a lot of the observations we have of queens, how long it takes for the queen to start laying eggs are from captive colonies, which is a really different situation. But um, for most species, even within the captive colonies, they'll, they'll usually, if you, if you have them and you're giving them pollen, they have pollen within a few days, they'll, they'll start laying eggs. So usually um, from when she starts building that nest to when she has um, workers is about a month. Great. Thanks, Celine. Um, I think at this point, we're going to wrap this up. There'll be a few more Q&A. There'll be another opportunity for Q&A after the um, conservation section. Um, thanks to all of you that answered the poll. It looks like most of you did, so we really appreciate that. I will end that now so that it'll get off of your screen. Um, and uh, I'm going to turn it over now to our conservation team, who's going to talk about bumblebee threats and conservation actions that we can take to help these animals recover. Okay, uh, I'm going to start this section. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen without incident. Uh, here we go. All right. Oop. Unfortunately, it's the first slide. It's not the first slide. Sorry about, oh. Sorry, folks, one second. Okay. 
All right. Um, so this section will be called uh, will be about bumblebee uh, threats and conservation actions. I'll I'll begin speaking. Then you'll hear from Lori. Then you'll hear from me again, and then you'll hear from Elise. So without further ado, let's get going. Um, we in the uh, in North America started noticing declines in bumblebees sometime in the 1990s. Before this, um, we were well aware of bumblebee distributions and um, and how they were doing to some extent. And there was no particular talk about bumblebees um, suffering a loss of habitat or or or, or abundance basically of declines. But in the early to mid 1990s, some um, observant bee biologists started reporting to others that they were not seeing particular species in the places they normally expected them or at the times that they did. And it turned out there were four species like this and they're all close relatives and they're scattered all over the continent. Um, that includes the Western bumblebee found on the West Coast, it, literally on the coast, as well as in the more montane parts of the West. Uh, Franklin's bumblebee found in a very small region of Southern Oregon and Northern California. It's a, it's a, its global distribution is about 120 miles long and maybe 70 miles wide. Uh, the yellow banded bumblebee, which is found in the east, uh, southward through the Appalachians and then northwest toward uh, Alaska through Canada. And then the rusty patch bumblebee, which is um, found uh, in the Midwest and um, formerly over much of the eastern states uh, and, so, and adjacent Canada. So these are species that are related to each other. And that got us thinking that there might be some sort of physiological or biological um, problem that was underlying their declines. And um, we now think that, that pathogens were part of the story for these bees, as you'll hear more about in a minute. Um, unfortunately, these were not the only bees that started to decline around that time. Um, and so the International Union for the Conservation of Nature formed this organization called the Bumblebee Specialist Group. And so um, some, of, some of the bumblebee biologists around the world volunteered their time to try to assess the status of the bumblebees found where we live as well as around the world um, using standard standardized methods that have to do with assessing the available data on bumblebees, which is typically um, it's specimen records. So people collected bees in 1975, they put them on pins and into museum drawers. That is a piece of data that we can use to understand um, changes in bumblebee distribution um, over time. And so um, we, uh, some of us on the call have worked in um, North America on some of these assessments and colleagues worked elsewhere around the world. And here is some of the data. So unfortunately for many areas of the world where bumblebees occur, we turns out we don't have enough data to assess the species. We don't have enough data to understand whether species X is um, is stable over time or it's it's increasing in commonness or perhaps decreasing. Um, North America is a bit different. We, we do have data from most of our species. And so when this assessment was done more than a decade ago now, um, for five of the roughly 50 species, we did not have enough data, but for the others we did. What I want you to see here is the, is the red to yellow, um, red to orange colors, and those would represent bees species that are at significant risk of extinction, um, lesser or greater within that category. So fully about a quarter of all of our bumblebees were assessed to be on the way out, not perched on the brink of extinction, but in serious decline or worse. And, um, and the other, uh, maybe it's 55 to 60% um, were found to be stable. So we can be happy about the majority being okay, but 25% of a taxon um, that's threatened is a, is a pretty high uh, fraction. And that other five species that we don't know enough about, um, we, should, we should consider it possible that they are also in those endangered or vulnerable categories once we do have enough data. So the problem could be even bigger than uh, uh, currently assessed in North America. So let's talk about who those species are. Uh, sorry, I think I skipped a slide. Uh, in the Western US, these are the species that we have pulled out as being of conservation concern. So you heard about Franklin's bumblebee, that's Bombus franklini. Uh, Suckley's cuckoo bumblebee is one of those parasitic uh, cuckoo bumblebees. Uh, and it occurs in the West in montane places as far south as extreme Northern California. 
and um, is still found in um, central and northern Canada with some abundance, but it is it is uh, in serious trouble here. Um, Crotchus bumblebee is a near California endemic. It's found just a bit in Baja California and Nevada, but otherwise entirely in the state of California. This one is uh, in, in serious decline, and we're currently trying to assess whether it uh, requires protection by the state's Endangered Species Act. Um, uh, obscure bumblebee or Bombus caliginosus is another. It's closely associated with the Pacific coast and the ecosystems there. Uh, it's found from California northward um, into British Columbia, I believe. Uh, Morrison's bumblebee is found broadly across the West, um, often at upper elevation in scrub or shrub type habitats, but in other habitats as well. Um, and then uh, the Western bumblebee I previously mentioned is found on the West Coast, as well as up in the mountains in the West and into Canada northward. Uh, the American bumblebee is found coast to coast. Um, and uh, it seems to be declining, especially at the northern margin of its range, which is um, opposite the, the, the climate change pattern that I mentioned when we were doing questions. Um, and I should just mention that that species um, in the West, there are populations that are considered to be a separate species by some taxonomists, considered to be a part of the same American bumblebee by others. Um, but both, both segregate groups are probably declining. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, Bombus fervidus, also including the, the species Bombus californicus, um, is another coast-to-coast -coast species with some taxonomic uncertainty. And there's a real coherent signal that this species is losing ground um, year upon year. In the east, um, here, here, here are the species that we are considering as um, as at risk. So everybody's heard about the rusty patch bumblebee or Bombus affinis. This one is found across the Midwest and in, and in the east, as previously mentioned. Suckley bumblebee is uh, also found in the east. It's disjunct there, um, possibly in formerly in New York state and perhaps other US states like Maine, but mostly in Canada, in the Eastern Maritimes, uh, there are populations of this bee and they're, they're disjunct from the Western populations by a great distance. And so there's probably no interbreeding be between the two. Uh, what is possibly the rarest bumblebee in the United States is a Bombus variabilis or the variable cuckoo bumblebee. This is a cuckoo, so it's a parasite. This one is an obligate parasite of just one species and that would be the American bumblebee previously mentioned as one that's in decline. So when your host is in decline and you have no options, you know, you tend to see that those um, those parasites become rare also. So as far as I know, there has been no observation of the variable cuckoo bumblebee for more than 20 years. Um, and that's despite a great increase in the number of observations of bumblebees that have has happened in the 21st century. So we're worried about that one. Uh, Bombus fraternis, the Southern Plains bumblebee, is broadly distributed through the plains and the Midwest. It's also found in the Southeast, but notably not up in the mountains. It's, it's on the coastal plain. It's closely associated with grasslands of all sorts. Um, and this species is under consideration for uh, endangered species protection at this time. Um, I mentioned Bombus fervidus for the West. It's also found in the East. I mentioned the American bumblebee already. This one is, is broadly distributed in the East. Um, and, and so um, it, it counts there. And then of course the yellow banded bumblebee again um, is, is a species of concern. And there's a photo of it to the right there um, taken in my mother's backyard <laughs> some time ago. Um, so let's talk about a couple of case studies there from, from those lists. So again, the rusty patch bumblebee, this was the first bumblebee to be listed on the federal endangered species list. It was 2017 when this happened. Um, the implications um, have been many, I would say. Um, for uh, I should first say, uh, as is sometime, sometimes when a species is listed, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will then designate what is called critical habitat. These are areas of habitat, as the name suggests, that the species really can't live without. And uh, it, it declined to uh, designate critical habitat in the beginning of the listing. Um, instead, uh, the service figured out what they call low potential and high potential zones, these polygons where that are centered on actual observations of the bee, um, where they expected people to um, to um, search for and protect the bee. Uh, I believe that they are now um, working on critical habitat for this species. 
Um, so there's a variety of other things that happened to protect this bee. There are federal legal restrictions on taking or um, killing or collecting. Um, there's money that flows to the states that in which this bee lives to support research and conservation efforts. And there are lots of researchers who are coming together to do work on this bee. In fact, just this, this last week, a great paper came out talking about the genetics of the remaining populations of this species and revealing that there's lots of segregation among the populations. They're really different from each other, meaning they're not probably not breeding and across the populations. And also that their uh, effective population size is very small. The number of individual colonies in an area is quite low for bumblebees. So um, this legal protection, uh, in my opinion, is doing a lot to protect the species. And um, it's we have not recovered the species yet, but we will um, hopefully get there. A second, and this one from the West, is Franklin's bumblebee. Uh, this one was listed uh, as endangered federally in 2023, I think last summer sometime, if I have that right, it might have been 2022. Um, so far, no critical habitat designation, but the service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, is again using these high potential zones, these buffer, uh, modeled buffer zones around the historic occurrences as their consideration of the areas that are critical to the animal. Um, and we are now seeing a similar pattern of federal actions to protect the species, and then um, newly available resources to support research, um, and then a lot of inventory work. The problem for this species is that we have not seen it since 2006, despite it being listed as endangered uh, recently, and despite a lot of people looking for it. So unfortunately, this one could be gone. Um, I personally think it's still out there, given um, uh, the remoteness and complexity of its habitats, but, but we really don't know. Okay, so at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Lori who will talk about threats. Awesome, thanks so much, Leif. Here. Lori, do you have control? I believe I do, it might take it a little second. If not, I'll share my screen. Okay, did I do that? <laughs> I think you yeah. did. Okay, cool. <laughs> if it's too laggy, then I'll, I'll share my screen. Um, great, thanks so much, Leif. I get to do the fun, depressing part <laughs> as well of this presentation to talk about some of the factors about why we are seeing some of these declines that Leif um, talked about. Um, so this is a great study and a figure from this study that looked at some of the major factors in why bumblebees are declining. And some of our major ones include habitat loss, such as loss to agriculture, residential areas, um, transportation corridors, um, things like that. Climate change is a major one. Pathogens spread, from, spread between bees, especially landing on flowers, and also pesticide exposure. So we'll go into these factors individually. Um, and I should mention that um, uh, there's a, a number of different um, threats to insects globally, and it's not just one specific thing that we can point a finger at. It's probably a bunch of different things working both in isolation and in conjunction with one another. Um, so we're going to single out some of the most important ones for bumblebees here. Leif, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to stop sharing, and I'm going to share my screen, I think. Okay, go ahead. Cool, thank you. This will hopefully go a little quicker. Okay, so a huge threat to bumblebees and insects and species generally is habitat loss. So the conversion of high quality habitat to developed impervious areas or areas that are less suitable for bumblebees um, fragmented areas and likewise. So say you have habitat like this, which is um, a prairie probably from somewhere in the Midwest and you see a bunch of different flowering species here. You see um, areas where bees might be able to nest. 
um, and lots of different foraging opportunities that are gonna persist throughout the entire year because there's a bunch of different flowering species. And then you compare it to something like this. Um, so on the left here, we have an agricultural area, um, perhaps for something like, I don't know, tobacco or soybean, um, where in this case, you have a monoculture of a single um, kind of species. Um, and agricultural habitats can sometimes provide resources for bees and bumblebees. Um, they can include flowering species that bees can forage on or bare soils that uh, bees can nest in. But it's a high risk environment for bumblebees, so they're likely to be exposed to pesticides. And then also if you consider the fact that there's one species often on the landscape, um, because herbicides have taken out things like um, other, other species, other flowering species that, that, that they could forage from. If you consider the fact that there's only one flowering species here, then the bumblebees on the landscape don't have foraging options throughout the entire year. Um, and then on the right, I include uh, a picture of a lawn in a suburban area, which is um, a more or less kind of a, uh, a diversity desert. Um, lawns are good at supporting some insects like um, white grubs, but not so good for, for bumblebees and pollinators. So. Um, Lots of ha habitat loss is a major factor affecting bumblebees. Um, just to lend some credence to this notion that habitat loss is a, a factor affecting bumblebees, um, we have maps from two separate studies here that are um, unrelated studies, but um, sort of demonstrate these patterns that we're observing. So on the left is a study that looked at the expansion of croplands in the United States and the areas on that map on the left that are darker red are areas where cropland expanded between 2008 and 2016. And during that time window, we saw about that 77% of converted land went from grasslands to cropland, especially um, wheat and grain crops. Um, so 2.98 million acres converted. And then on the right, again, this is an unrelated study, but it's interesting to look at the patterns here. Um, we have a graph showing, or we have a map showing patterns of wild bee abundance decrease. So the, those areas that are um, deeper pinkish red are areas where they've estimated that there is bump, there is um, wild bee decrease um, between 2008 and 2013. And during this time, we the authors witnessed about a 23% estimated decline in wild bees. And many of those areas, um, like you see, um, in southern Idaho and in the um, in the Montanas um, are areas where a lot of that land was converted to cropland. So 60% of the areas where those declines were detected were areas with a high degree of grassland being converted to cropland. So there's decent evidence here to support the fact that conversion of habitat to agriculture is a major factor affecting wild bees, including bumblebees. Another huge threat to bumblebees and other bees in general is pesticide exposure. And when I say pesticide, I don't just mean insecticides, I mean also herbicides and fungicides and also any of those things working both together and in isolation. Um, uh, a major sort of buzzword and, and, and threat to, to bees specifically are neonicotinoids. Um, which are what we would call systemic insecticides. And when we refer to a systemic insecticide, we mean one that is um, taken up through the roots of the plants and then expressed in the tissues of the plant itself, including through the pollen and the nectar and other things that pollinators are actively feeding on. So this map shows the increase in the use of a particular neonicotinoid, imidacloprid, from the early 90s when it was introduced to about 2014. Um, and it became super popular with farmers on agricultural landscapes. And you can see um, just how much of the landscape imidacloprid is used on. Um, and so it's tempting to sort of point the picture, point your finger at agriculture as um, sort of the, the major villain in terms of pesticide use. Um, but it's worth noting that pesticides are used in a number of different contexts and a major part of the pesticide industry um, is home use and garden and home lawn use. So this graph is showing on the vertical axis, um, it's estimating the amount of pesticides used in the US based on how much money they've produced. And then on um, the x-axis is the kinds of um, pesticides being used. 
And if you look at insecticides, that gray box is the proportion of insecticide sales that can be attributed to home and garden use. So this is um, people pulling something off of their shelves, say at a Home Depot or perhaps used by lawn care companies. Um, a major chunk of pesticide use in home and garden contexts in, in insecticides are for home and garden contexts. Um, and there's uh, very different, it's, it's very different to compare home and garden context to um, agricultural context because oftentimes farmers actually have to be trained and take a test to confirm um, that they know the risks and how to use pesticides, but those aren't the, there aren't the same restrictions for home users of pesticides. So it's kind of a huge black box of data. We don't know how these pesticides are being used in what concentration and where. Um, so it's just worth considering that um, it's both agriculture and at home use. Um, and so how are these insects actually being exposed to pesticides? Well, there's a number of different ways. There's the systemic way that I discussed earlier, wherein the pesticide is actually taken up and expressed in the plant itself. Um, there's also the kind of obvious one, direct contact. So a field gets sprayed and it actually directly wets the insect itself. Indirect contact, so the plant gets sprayed and an insect visits that plant. And then there are um, pathways of exposure that we know a lot less about. Um, some bees actually take parts of leaves and use those to build their nests. And when they take a uh, part of a leaf that's been sprayed, they're bringing contaminated nest materials into their nest, um, which is presumably exposing them to pesticides. And we know a lot less about how pesticide exposure affects bees in this way. Um, we're also still struggling to understand how pesticide exposure um, affects insects that are ground nesting um, and how pesticides get to them that way. So there, a lot of the pesticide research that has been done so far focuses on, on honeybees and to a lesser degree on bumblebees but wild bees broadly, we know far less about how pesticides are affecting them. Um, and just to illustrate this point, this is a graph showing the number of studies on um, pesticides and how they affect bees. Um, and the dotted lines is, is the number of studies over time looking at honeybees specifically with the blue being insecticides generally and the pink being new nicotinoids. And honeybees far outweigh other bee species in terms of where the studies have been. So um, they're kind of our, in terms of regulation, um, the honeybees are kind of our, our um, baseline and we don't know how they're affecting other bees. Um, we also have a limited understanding of how pesticides in, are affecting bees on a sublethal level. So um, sometimes pesticides might kill an insect outright, but also sometimes a chemical may affect an in insect's ability to reproduce or function, its cognitive function. So there's a lot of unknowns on that front. And we also consider how many chemicals get used. Um, for pesticides, we have little understanding of how these chemicals interact with each other, might um, facilitate or, or um, worsen the effects of, of one another. An another threat to bumblebees um, that's been pretty directly implicated for the declines of certain species is disease. Um, and there are a slew of diseases that affect honeybees and bumblebees and other bees. I just singled out some of the major players on this slide, which are a number of um, single cell parasites that infect the guts of bees and can uh, affect their ability to survive, reproduce, um, forage successfully, um, various ways that they can affect a bee's ability to live. And disease have been in implicated for some species um, as the major factor in their decline. One where we have a pretty certain grasp that diseases are the, are the factor at play in its decline is the Patagonian bumblebee or the giant bumblebee. Bombus dalbomii, which occurs in South America and is a really beautiful fuzzy red bee. Um, and we know we have good evidence that commercial bees imported into South America, non-native bees, and the diseases that they bring um, are a factor affecting the decline of the Patagonian bumblebee. And we have some evidence for other bees, including the rusty patch bumblebee and perhaps a Western bumblebee that um, diseases, especially uh, um, from imported commercial bumblebees, um, may be a factor in the decline of these species.
Um, so just a word on commercial bumblebees for a second. Um, so you can buy commercial bumblebees and they are important in agriculture. And you've heard about buzz pollination and how certain plant species actually really benefit from being pollinated by a bumblebee. So bumblebees get used in certain uh, crops like greenhouse tomatoes and blueberries as a way to effectively improve the crop. Um, but it comes with risks. So uh, commercial bumblebees can help move around and amplify pathogens um, wherever they're bought and placed. Um, and there's a lot of unknowns on this front as well as to what degree these bumblebees are importing these pathogens, where these patterns are, are emerging. Because as of yet, commercial bumblebee, um, the commercial bumblebee industry is unregulated in most US states, except for Oregon and California. So there's a lot of unknowns about where these bumblebees are actually being imported. Um, other bees, uh, honeybees, can also pass diseases to native bees. Um, so when they interact on a flower or they're interacting on the same flower, this is can, can be a major vector for passing on diseases. Um, and the graph on the left is from a study that examined the relationship between bumblebees um, and their disease prevalence based on how near or far they were from a managed honeybee hive. And they found that um, bumblebees that were near um, a managed honeybee hive tended to have more parasite species than those that were far away. Um, and they also observed a high proportion of those ones near the hive, the honeybee hive had more of a disease called Chrysidia bombii or bombi, um, which is good evidence that um, honeybees are actively or not actively, but by way of them being on the landscape, transferring diseases to bumblebees. And this can affect bumblebees abundance and ability to thrive on the landscape where honeybees occur. Um, and so there are sort of three major mechanisms why, my, where we might talk about how diseases are transmitted. They're spillover, so directly from managed bees to native bees where they're interacting on the same flowers. Um, facilitation, so there's a factor where managed bees are competing with wild bees for the same resources, um, imposing a stress and thereby making those wild bees more um, susceptible to contract and feel the effects of disease. And there's also spillback. So each managed bees and wild bees have um, diseases and they can serve as reservoirs for one another. So um, a disease can be spilled from wild bees to managed bees, served as a reservoir in managed bees and then spill back again, perhaps amplified or changed in some, in some way. Um, while we're on the topic of, of honeybees, uh, it's worth noting that honeybees can compete directly with native bees. Bum honeybees are extremely efficient foragers. Um, and one study I think really illustrates this case where a hive of um, a, a, a good strong honeybee hive, say of several tens of thousands of individuals over the course of the summer can collect as much pollen as needed to provision 100,000 solitary bee larvae. So you can imagine just a single good honeybee hive on the landscape really affects how, many, how much resources are available for um, wild bees on the landscape. So we say all that um, just to drive point the home, drive home the point that um, we love honeybees. They're they're fantastic um, hobby. They're important for agriculture. They're a great source of, of honey and beeswax and the like. Um, but keeping honeybees is a, is akin to keeping chickens. They're a domestic animal, and and beekeeping is not necessarily wildlife conservation. Um, and if not done well with with uh, diseases. Um, disease management kept in mind and ample flowering resources kept in mind, adding honeybees to the landscape may have a negative effect on native bees. The last threat I'll talk about, which was mentioned a little bit earlier, is, is climate change. So Leif discussed this in the Q&A a little bit, but as we're seeing temperature shifts, we're seeing um, populations of bumblebees blink out in certain places or shift in certain places. So we're seeing latitudinal shifts, um, wherein at the southernmost portions of certain of the ranges of certain bumblebees, we're seeing those shift upwards with not necessarily a likewise northern shift. So 
um, a range contraction essentially on a latitudinal level. And we're also seeing that at an elevational level. So as temperatures increase, um, you see essentially bumblebees getting pushed up the mountain um, uh, and uh, limiting the area where they can actually occupy. And then we're seeing timing shifts. So um, phenology has been brought up a little bit, but uh, the timing of when flowers and uh, bees become active. In general, bees and flowers are shifting sort of earlier in the year and in general shifting with each other. But there have been some studies that have observed some mismatches um, wherein uh, bees may emerge and certain flowers are not necessarily available at certain times, which may have an impact on how much they're able to forage. So this is just a summary of all the things I've talked about of the major threats to bumblebees, pesticides or pesticide exposure, um, habitat loss, which it can, can include to agriculture and residential areas, as well as forms of habitat loss in terms of habitat degradation, fragmentation, and then climate change, um, forcing um, bumblebees to have range limitations and shifting where and when they're active in the year. Um, and also disease, especially um, spilling over from commercial bees. And I will stop sharing and have you start sharing, Leaf. Okay, great. Yes, I will go back to sharing my version of this slide. Okay. All right. Thank you, Lori. Uh, I'll now talk about conservation efforts to address some of those threats. Um, and let's get started. So at Xerces, we like to um, think about three different domains of, of conservation for bumblebees. Um, one thing that we are heavily focused on and we proselytize about, I would say, is the importance of data. Um, we know a lot about the past with respect to where and when bumblebees were found. But in fact, um, we just have these little collections here and there. None of it is systematic. We don't have a coherent um, set of information that tells us really about anything about abundance of bumblebees or very much about change over time. So um, we think we need more data. Um, we also uh, advocate a focus on habitat parameters for bumblebees. And that would be for nectar and pollen plants, as well as nesting sites and overwintering sites. And then we want you to think about going beyond simply the flowers to uh, habitat um, items that might um, be a little bit harder to incorporate into your personal landscape or a little more challenging to, um, to provide. Uh, so one of those um, ways that we see um, uh, to, to collect data and get a better baseline of information about bumblebees is community science projects such as Bumblebee Atlas. Um, we also have the Bumblebee Watch website, which uh, is used for the data from the Atlas projects, but also for anyone who has a photo of a bumblebee that they would like to submit, as a, uh, it, which will become a durable record of occurrence. So any photo taken with any camera, if it's good enough for identification, um, can become one of these actual scientific records. Uh, and so Bumblebee Watch is one of uh, a number of different sites where you can add information like this. The other big one is iNaturalist. I'm sure most people are well aware of iNaturalist, but these kinds of community science platforms are producing a ton of data. And um, you'll hear more about this from, um, from Elise a little bit later. Um, we also uh, provide identification resources and other kinds of supports on this website. Um, for people who are interested in learning more about the bees and, and perhaps learning more about how to contribute to their protection through data collection. Uh, speaking of the bumblebee atlases, uh, we this year have projects active in 20 states across the US. As you can see in green here, uh, I think we were at 15 states last year. So the project has swollen in the last year and is continuing to grow. So this is a uh, it's been a successful project started in the Pacific Northwest states. It's working successfully in lots of other places at the same time. And we're finding that uh, folks in other states are interested in helping us. So the project is growing quickly. Um, we want to make sure that you understand it's not just the Xerces Society doing this. We have, we have so many important 
um, um, partners in these various places that we work, uh, often state wildlife agencies, local nonprofits, and of course, just human beings who are interested in this stuff. So more about that a little bit later. So what about that bumblebee habitat that we're saying is important for you to think about when you think about conservation approaches to bumblebees? Well, of course, we've already talked about the food side. This is very important. Bumblebees need, um, for the most part, they just need two things to, to, to eat, and that is nectar and pollen, both coming from flowers. The type of flower matters, as we will see, um, and the timing of its presentation matters to bumblebees, but food is a, is a key resource, and that usually means areas of flowering plants in wild or semi-wild areas. Um, bumblebees need shelter, so that would be for nesting as well as overwintering, and so we want to make sure, to the extent that we can, based on the information we have, that there are available nesting sites, those are often below ground, and that there are available places where the bees can dig in and uh, overwinter just below the surface of the soil. Um, and that includes uh, protection from managed bees, which sometimes are going to cause problems for, um, for bumblebees. Uh, we think that connectivity is really important. This is a classic um, aspect of conservation science. And when we talk about con connectivity, people will often think about large carnivores and how they can use riparian strips to get from one piece of habitat to another. It's important to understand that while these bumblebees may have a smaller home range than a leopard or um, a lion, um, they, uh, they also need connectivity. I, I said earlier that the rusty patch bumblebee has been shown just last week to um, have lots of genetic differentiation among the, po the populations. That means that they are not passing genes back and forth. They're not interbreeding. And this connectivity through riparian zones, as well as uh, green greenways in town, um, roadside plantings and so on is really important. And then we want to protect bumblebees from certain threats that they find um, in habitat components. And pesticides is, is really the, the, the biggest category of those, those stressors or threats that we will talk about. All right, so about plants. If you're interested in planting for bumblebees or just learning more about how to do it on any scale, be it your backyard or your, your farm or the lands that you manage as a professional or, or so on, um, there's a lot to learn about which plants are beneficial, which are of less value to the bees. So bumblebees, as you've heard, are generalists. They literally eat thousands of different species of plants. They can eat so many different things. But within the species, there are some preferences. And then within for the individual bee, we see specialization on particular types of flowers. So generally speaking, we want to give them uh, native plants wherever we are. Um, sometimes if we can get local genotypes of those native plants, that's even better for various broader conservation reasons. Um, bumblebees use a wide array of flowers. Some of the ones you see here are among the most popular for the bees. Um, uh, a question, are all flowers equally good? For, uh, for bees, and I think that you'll, um, you'll intuit that the answer is no. Um, there are many great things for bumblebees to eat at your local gardening center, but also some, some duds. Uh, and so while these are very lovely plants, this particular thing is of no use to bumblebees. Um, I, I think this plant makes nectar. I can't, I can't remember the name, but it, it just isn't something the bees will use, even if you put it right in front of them. Many of the cultivars that we love so much have been modified through artificial selection, sometimes other processes, but generally just people selecting on, on mutants uh, to produce beautiful but unusual flor floral morphologies that don't include the resources. A classic uh, example is roses. If you could think about the, the, the 12 um, stemmed roses in a bouquet with, with lots of overlapping petals, that is the result of this artificial selection. And the petals have actually replaced some of this, the anthers where the pollen is held. Um, a wild uh, rose just has five petals and lots and lots of anthers in the middle and then the female parts. And they, they some make nectar, some don't. So um, we wanna think a little bit about getting plants that are both native and um, uh, have not been selected on for, you know, for human interests outside of, of habitat um, uses. Uh, so generally local nurseries are the place to find uh, those native plants. Um, not all nurseries specialize in this. Um, and the larger big box stores generally don't carry a lot of native plants, but the ones in my area, you can get a few things, a few things there. We do want to think about um, pesticides in uh, 
it used in the production of, of some of these um, plants and horticultural centers. That is a, a large um, topic that we could discuss if people want to bring it up as a question. So uh, for bumblebees, they're active for a very long period of time relative to other bees. Other bees might have a, a, a two or three week life history, activity period in their life history, where the female is actively excavating a nest, putting pollen and nectar in it, laying an egg, closing the cell, maybe repeating that 20 times and she dies and that's it. Uh, bumblebees, as you've heard, they start in springtime. And the colony lasts consistently until whenever they wrap up um, late summer, fall, even late fall. And so they need food every day of that of that period. They do store food. They can store uh, maybe a week's amount of nectar and pollen, but certainly no more than that. Um, and so it's very critical for them that they actually have plants um, season long. The two most important periods are early spring when the queens are solitary and they are foraging to feed themselves and foraging to provision their nascent colonies. Um, this is a time when there aren't very many things in flower. And so whatever we can do to help them in that time um, is really important. So for example, if you are a, a, a gardener in the Midwest and you wanna help those queens, uh, a great idea would be to use willow, get yourself some willows. Um, they're a very important pollen source for bumblebees as well as a nectar source and um, they're lovely plants and they bloom um, in early spring. The other critical period is fall. So at the end of the colony season, we see the, the newly produced reproductives, the males and the queens come out of the nest and they forage for food and, and meet and mate. The mated queens then have to eat a lot of food to produce internal uh, fat stores so that they can make it through the winter. And we know that when there isn't a lot blooming at the end of the year, for example, because of, of a drought, um, uh, they just don't do as well, and fewer of them will make it through the season. If they live in marginal habitats where there aren't a lot of flowers, that is a limiting factor on bumblebee populations, and that's something we can easily do something about. Um, if you live in the range of, of goldenrod, as depicted here, uh, no problem. This is a great plant. It's easy to grow, and um, it supports a wide array of bumblebee species. Um, we like to couch the, the messages about food plants and those habitat items in um, in um, the broader question of land management. And we have this wonderful guide um, written by some of my colleagues at Xerces, uh, led by Rich, uh, called Conserving Bumblebees. You can find this on our website in our publications library. And this is, um, this is a set of guidelines for those who manage lands, um, home, homeowners, other land owners and managers. And we outlined a variety of threats to the bees here. We talk about how to increase habitat for them um, and how to do so in a regionally specific um, basis. And um, we include some stuff about identification in, in this guide. Um, we can also think about, about placing our um, interest in providing habitat for bumblebees in the framework of statewide actions. And so there are, we are slowly working to put together statewide conservation plans for bumblebees. And based on the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas, we at Xerces have produced this one that you see um, on the right, a strategy to protect bumblebees in the state of Washington. Um, this include, is data-driven, evidence-driven. Um, it's based on the, the information that the volunteers brought to us from those three states. Um, and so with that information, we're able to write this document that tells you where are the geographic pro priorities for protecting bumblebees? Um, what should you do to do so? Um, what are the, the highest priorities with respect to species and geography? And what are the specific threats that bumblebees face in this geography? And of course, um, Researchers love to say more research is needed. And so um, all of this work, all of this evidence put together in this coherent place does lead to lots of new questions that we can answer through more research. Um, I wanna say that one of the things that we see in publications like this, we have the ability to put together to gather really detailed um, host plant guides for the, for the bumblebees. So here's an example from the Pacific Northwest, and it's based on data from that atlas um, of, of some of the plants that bumblebees heavily favor and the timing at which they're available. And so again, these bumblebees need a long period of time during which they have access to flowers. And using these species right here, we can see that they could get through um, the whole season. Of course, they need other things too. But when you start graphing out the seasonal availability of the plants like this, 
you can sometimes immediately see uh, something's missing. Something's missing in the first two weeks of June. Um, and then you can start to think about what plants do bloom then. You can go look at the, um, the uh, uh, field guides for those plants. You can um, think about what you can, what's available uh, for purchase and planting. And maybe you can, you can um, fill that gap at least locally. Um, just one more example, this is for the whole of the US. Um, it's, an, it's another attempt to show um, some of the more important bumblebee plants and when they flower. And the fact that we wanna see over, overlapping or interleaving of, um, of, those, of those periods of activity, of flowering activity for those plants. Yep. Sorry. There we go. Okay, moving on from the plants, um, I said that bumblebees need shelter. So let's talk more about that shelter. That's two things. It's shelter for nesting and it's for overwintering. The most important nesting substrates for bumblebees are below ground, although some of them will nest above ground or on the surface of the ground. Um, the most often used type of habitat is an abandoned rodent burrow. That's true in Iowa, that's true in California, that is true in New Hampshire, it's true in Florida. Uh, they love these old rodent burrows. Um, and so species are somewhat, somewhat flexible in what habitats they can use and just we will often find them in rodent burrows. They will also use other types of underground cavities that are created by people or maybe by a tree rotting away and leaving a, a place where the root was once was or other uh, rocky processes, other things that leave holes in the ground, but they cannot excavate that cavity themselves. They need a preformed cavity. Uh, as I said, some of them will nest literally right on the surface in grasslands. So you can imagine what happens during haying or uh, they can easily be trampled. Um, so there it's a rather tenuous existence for those bees. And then there are those that like to nest in trees and they'll often accept things like bird houses. Um, for overwintering, we see the bees, uh, instead of ne needing a preformed cavity that they go inside of, they actually dig a shallow hole. Maybe I've watched them do this, maybe two to four inches in depth. Um, if you're in grass, it's often just below turf grass root zone. And um, they're not making a big opening. They're actually burying themselves alive. They're, they're touched by the dirt the whole winter. And they go into a, a diapause or a sort of torpor during that time in which they slowly subsist on um, stored fat reserves. So again, we have talked about connectivity and its importance. Um, functionally, what does that mean? Well, uh, looking at the city of Sacramento here, we can, from above, we can see lots of little dots of habitat in backyards, a couple of parks perhaps, um, and then some more marginal, but potentially habitat areas like golf course edges, um, the edges of farm fields. But um, when you think about a landscape like this, there are a lot of barriers to migration and movement for bumblebees. Even though they fly, um, they may have a hard time getting from one little patch of habitat to another. So aspects of um, management like this greenway we see, uh, I'm not sure if that's a Sacramento River or one of its tributaries, but that beautiful sinuous green area along the river, that's the kind of thing that bees will use to move um, between areas. And it's the kind of thing that would link in a genetic sense over time, different populations that might otherwise be um, discrete from each other. So we can, um, we can piggyback these kinds of connectivity onto other conservation efforts. We can also think about, think creatively about what constitutes a corridor for an invertebrate that can fly. And it might be a little different from that necessary for a large carnivore, for example. But connectivity is definitely a part of the picture. Research um, um, shows us that this is so, and I, we think that we should do more of this. Uh, and that means that we should do conservation everywhere. We should think about bumblebee habitat occurring everywhere. These are not animals that only occur up high in the mountains or in special spots that most people don't get to go to. They're actually animals that live all around us, including some of the most imperiled ones like the rusty patch bumblebee, which can be found in people's backyards in urban areas. So um, we need to think creatively about where and how we can create habitat. And that would in include things like roadside plantings, um, better use of the space in public parks for um, creating habitat for bees, as you see in the top right photo. That would include working with growers to reduce their pesticide use, to help them put in flowering strips um, like the one you see in the bottom left. And of course, lots of outreach to homeowners about the fact that the little 
uh, stamp of habit of, of land that, uh, that they may manage on earth is actually important to these animals. And without much effort, you can create something beautiful that uh, can actually really benefit the bees, such as this planting of echinacea in the bottom right. Now, we need to talk a little bit about the quality of these habitats. We've now talked about sort of the quantity of nesting, um, of forage and wintering habitat. Let's make more of it was basically my message, but the quality really matters. And one of the key drivers of quality in bumblebee habitats is whether or not they are exposed to pesticides. And so this uh, picture from the USGS of estimated uses of one neonicotinoid nicotinoid chemical imatocoprid um, in one year show that, that it's a widespread chemical. This is something that's dangerous for bees and um, it can make a big difference in habitat quality. So um, we, know, we know that there are interacting effects of these stressors and threats as we've, as we've discussed. And so when you add um, pesticides to maybe marginal habitat or to bees that are stressed by, by uh, pathogens in their guts, um, you might see a, a non-additive negative effects. So extra synergistic negative impacts of, of these pesticides and other factors on the bees. Um, so there's a lot you can do to reduce pesticide exposure for bees. Um, don't use them is one is one thing you can do. Um, limit your use of them is a is a more realistic and practical piece of advice for many people. So it, it, we're not really saying don't use them at all, never. Um, but think about your personal use of pesticides and just how important they are to your management of your area, your land. Um, so many of us can reduce the total amount of pesticides that we use, um, and you can find a lot of help from um, local extension agents, master gardener programs, and others who will give you solutions for or um, ways to manage uh, weeds and other issues without, um, without pesticides or with fewer pesticides. Um, and so uh, the Xerces Society's approach to pest management is, is systemic. We wanna take a systems uh, view of the problem, uh, the challenge, which is how to grow plants without invertebrates um, chomping on them. And so uh, we don't, we don't wanna just isolate the lettuce plants um, from the rest of the earth and bring in a chemical from outside and kill all the bugs on the lettuce. We want to think more holistically about this, uh, about an ecological system that a farm is, if it's functioning well. And so in this picture, you see some crop plants and you see in between the rows, a number of other plants being grown, both as food for pollinators in the case of that red clover and perhaps um, host plant areas, intermediate areas for some of the natural enemies of the pests. Those, the, the fluffy leaved plants are probably doing that. So it's, um, we, we envision a, a sort of ecological pest management where pesticide use could be part of the picture depending on the system that you're managing, but that it is part of an ecological system. And you wanna think about other ways that pests may be managed um, rather than picking up the spray nozzle first. And um, one other effect uh, on the quality of habitat is those managed pollinators. You've already heard that bees, both bumblebees and honeybees, can cause problems for native bumblebees. And that's through competition for resources, which can be very intense with, bumble with honeybees. And then also the spread of pathogens, which happens from both the managed bumblebees and the managed honeybees. And so when we're thinking about habitat creation, habitat protection, um, we want to think about this as a potential stressor for those bees. Are there a lot of um, honeybees in the system? Are you managing your yard right next to an apiary, for example? That would affect the quality of and the value of that habitat for, um, for bumblebees. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Elise, who will talk more about community science. Thank you, Leif. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, can everybody see that all right? Awesome. Okay, so I wanted to kind of wrap things up here and we'll talk a little bit about some of the outcomes of the Bumblebee Atlas um, and also just about um, community science as another approach to effective bumblebee conservation. So community science is broadly defined as a form of research that provides everyone, regardless of their background, an opportunity to contribute meaningful data to further our scientific understanding of key issues. So the Bumblebee Atlas is an example of a community science project where people can volunteer their time to gather data that helps um, scientists make 
uh, recommendations for conservation and land management. Um, we have seen a real explosion of observations uh, when it comes to bumblebees uh, because of the help of community scientists that we've had um, over the last handful of years. Uh, this explosion of data kind of started in 2018, as you can see here in this graph, uh, with which is when the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas was kicked off. And as we've seen the atlas spread to more and more states, we have seen uh, the amount of data coming in really um, increase. And this is helping us learn a lot more about bumblebees. Um, we will be launching some more bumblebee atlas projects uh, this season in 2024. So Iowa, Colorado, Montana, um, and Wyoming are some of those states that we will see um, new data coming in and help us learn a little bit more about bumblebees. Um, since the Bumblebee Atlas's inception, we've seen uh, patterns change in terms of data collection. We're learning a lot about bumblebees in the areas that have Bumblebee Atlas projects, um, but we are still seeing some gaps uh, in areas where Atlas projects have not been launched yet. Um, so you can see based on this graphic kind of where the density of data is um, in those areas with Atlas projects. Um, the Southeast Bumblebee Atlas was launched in 2023. So that's um, an area where we are um, able to see kind of some of those gaps slowly closing. And with the new projects coming in 2024, we'll hope to see more widespread um, data collection. And the data that has been collected so far has helped our scientists uh, develop a lot of different conservation tools. So these are tools that are used by land stewards, natural resource professionals, and conservationists who are interested in supporting bumblebees. Um, guidance that's been developed so far includes things like identification guides, uh, detailed species profiles, and habitat management recommendations uh, for different parts of the country. Um, Community science uh, or community scientists have helped us to detect more rare species in places that more professional surveys were not able to detect them. So Leaf mentioned earlier that the Western bumblebee is a vulnerable species on the West Coast. And uh, we have learned a lot about um, this particular bumblebee species thanks to our community scientists. Um, and this has helped us document the species and understand their distribution, uh, particularly along the West Coast coast. Um, one of the gaps that we have in bumblebee knowledge is um, related to life history and related to nesting. Um, in general, there is a lot that we don't know about bumblebee nesting um, and understanding the nesting uh, biology of rare species in particular can help us to better protect and conserve these rare or endangered species. So five Western bumblebee nests uh, were detected and described in this um, guide where that provides some guidance uh, for for managing and protecting uh, potential nesting areas in the future. Um, Leaf already mentioned uh, this um, additional outcome that was created based on data gathered through the Bumblebee Atlas uh, developed in Washington State. This is a strategy prote to protect state and federally protected bumblebees of conservation concern. Um, so this guide identifies priority conservation areas for eight different species, um, assesses different threats that are affecting these different species and provides a list of best management practice to support bumblebee populations. Community science data from the Bumblebee Atlas in the Pacific Northwest has also provided scientists with the information they need to write and publish different papers. Um, this is one of those examples uh, which assesses the Western bumblebee. Um, another product from the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas that is based on community science data um, is this species and summary or summary of species accounts. This publication includes gathered data points like plant lists, elevation charts, habitat types, phenology information, and species distribution models, um, all of which are helpful in understanding bumblebee needs and future conservation actions across the Pacific Northwest. 
So part of the Bumblebee Atlas, so part of doing your Bumblebee survey, also includes filling out a habitat assessment form, um, which also allows us to understand more about sort of the surrounding area of your survey rather than just the plants that the bumblebees are being collected from. We're zooming out of the Pacific Northwest and into the Midwest. Um, we have uh, several different states in the Minnesota or the Midwest Bumblebee Atlas, um, including Nebraska, Missouri, Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Kansas, and then Iowa um, in this year, 2024. Um, nearly 20,000 observations of bumblebees have been made, uh, and this accounts for about 28 different species being documented. And this data is the result of 2,200 plus surveys uh, that have been done by about 400 different community scientists. So a lot of effort and time uh, has been put into gathering data about bumblebees by our volunteers. Um, in Nebraska, this habitat management guide was developed um, that includes recommended practices like grazing, prescribed fire, haying and mowing, invasive plant control and pesticide use. Um, just peeking in to what that guide looks like, uh, providing some plant information, um, as well as some of those management guidelines. And this again was developed based on some of that data gathered by community scientists. Um, another outcome of the Bumblebee Atlas um, are new records. Um, so Bumblebee Atlas projects have allowed for documentation of a lot of new species records. Um, in Missouri, uh, the Missouri Bumblebee Atlas was launched in 2022. There were 67 observations of uh, Bombus fraternus, uh, the Southern Plains bumblebee, another bumblebee that Leaf mentioned earlier as an endangered species that we are particularly um, interested in conserving. Um, so these were observations uh, prior to 2023, uh, but all of these uh, observations made in Missouri uh, were recorded from native plant species, and they were only found where a diversity of native plants were in bloom, which is suggesting that um, Bombus fraternus, the southern plains bumblebee, is preferring those more native species. Um, so these records were found in 15 uh, counties, five of them in 2020, five in 2021, and five in 2022. And in 2023, we had our first Bumblebee Atlas documentation of uh, Bombus fraternus here in Minnesota, uh, where I'm based out of. And this was our third observation um, of this species in the state of Minnesota. So it's really cool to see that our community scientists are able to find these uh, more rare and endangered species. So again, looking uh, at some more of the Midwest data, we're zooming into Minnesota now. Uh, between June and September of 2023, uh, 42 Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas participants conducted 167 bumblebee investigations across our state. Uh, so this brings us to a total of 441 investigations or surveys since the year 2020. Um, we've got a lot of good coverage around the Twin Cities area, but we're looking to expand into some more rural parts of the state, uh, particularly in um, the, the northern half of Minnesota. And since 2020, um, 66 Atlas participants have documented 5,684 individual bumblebees. Uh, the majority of those have already been verified or identified. Um, and this represents 20 out of our 24 bumblebees that we see in Minnesota. Um, the big three, so this is a group of bumblebees that are super common um, in Minnesota, which is the common eastern bumblebee, the two-spotted bumblebee, and the brown-belted bumblebee, um, make up about half of the observations that we've seen between 2020 and 2023. Data collected it during uh, Bumblebee Atlas surveys in Minnesota has also helped us understand more about the endangered rusty patch bumblebee, um, particularly helping us understand how much this species has declined. Um, 
So you can see in the pie chart on the left, uh, those are the incidental sightings. So you can go into Bumblebee Watch and upload uh, just a photo or observation of one bee as opposed to um, many as part of the Bumblebee Atlas. Um, many sightings were reported as incidental sightings and fewer were reported um, as part of more formal Bumblebee Atlas surveys. But because seeing Rusty Patch Bumblebee is so rare, it is important to still record these incidental observations because recording as much data as possible um, is valuable for this species. So in 2023, 116 rusty patch bumblebees were sighted in Minnesota and uploaded to Bumblebee Watch, uh, but the majority of these being uh, those incidental observations. Um, only five rusty patch bumblebees were observed during formal bumblebee atlas surveys. Um, and if you were to look at the incidental observations on their own, it would seem as though rusty patched bumblebee is documented fairly frequently. Um, but when you're following uh, the bumblebee atlas protocols or you doing sort of an equal effort sampling where everybody is using the same protocol and collecting or and photographing all of the bumblebees that they're seeing, uh, Rusty Patch Bumblebee is documented less frequently, uh, which gives us a little bit more accurate picture of how abundant they are on our landscapes. So ultimately, uh, regardless of your region, uh, so the Pacific Northwest, the Midwest, the Southeast, all of these different parts of the country, research um, is proving that photo-based monitoring, uh, so the Atlas, the Bumblebee Atlas is a type of this photo-based monitoring, um, is an effective way to monitor bumblebees. Um, uh, research is suggesting that um, an expert identified 92.4% of bees from photographs, whereas 98.2% of bees were identified from specimens. Um, so it's fairly similar in terms of um, identification abilities for bumblebees um, from photos based on actual specimens. Um, another benefit to being able to identify bees to species from photos alone um, like we do in the atlas, um, is that these are not um, lethal protocols. So no bumblebees are killed or harmed or um, taken with us out of the field, uh, which overall, you know, supports the community and those non-lethal sampling practices um, are good for bumblebee conservation. Well, we have gathered a lot of data and have made, produced a lot of um, research reports and guidelines and recommendations based on this data. Uh, there still are um, some gaps we hope to fill um, in future in the future, um, particularly in sort of more undersurveyed areas like the South Central United States and New England, um, making our bumblebee data publicly accessible helps to aid in evidence-based management and conservation decision-making. Um, data can also help to inform gaps in life history knowledge and give us a better understanding of overall bumblebee needs. And in the future, we hope to implement a long-term monitoring plan that balances different needs and other interested partners who want to help to support bumblebees. And I will turn it back over to Lori to kind of wrap things up for us here. Thanks, Elise. Do you want to just keep sharing the screen and, and, and move forward? Um, so just really quick here at the end, um, there are a bunch of resources available. Um, there are a few books published by the Xerces Society with more suggestions for how to attract pollinators and plant suggestions for how to feed them. Next slide. Um, we also have a bunch of free downloadable uh, brochures available for downloading. Um, some of them, like conserving bumblebees there on the bottom right, have been mentioned in this PowerPoint. Um, uh, so with suggestions for how to manage your landscapes, your backyards, and provide habitat for bumblebees. Okay. Um, and um, there are a bunch of different ways to connect with the Xerces Society. We've mentioned perhaps a few at this point, but... Um, Again, this webinar will be uploaded to YouTube. You can also find the Bumblebee Atlas on our Facebook page, on our Twitter or X, um, and on Instagram. And we have regional versions of these available as well. Um, and that wraps up the conservation portion.
Excellent. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. I am going to just direct people to the Q&A sort of answered tab there for most of the questions. We, we only have about 15 minutes left, and I just want to make sure there's enough time to go over the last few details here. Um, so just to be clear, um, the purpose of this webinar today was to give people sort of the background and understanding of bumblebee ecology and conservation to inform our Bumblebee Atlas volunteers sort of why we're doing this project and why it will make a difference. The next step for you after taking this webinar will be for you to find your local atlas and then take a training workshop. We have in-person and webinar options for all of our local um, atlas projects throughout the 20 states in which we're active. It would encourage you to find um, the the resources and, and, and trainings that are available to you. Each region sort of has their own protocols. So we're now doing this ecology and conservation as one big team, but then we'll break off and talk about our individual projects, even though we share protocols for the most part. So the best place to do that right now is to go to, um, to bumblebeeatlas.org. And it will take you to the, the URL where you will learn about sort of our overall program. I will also just let you know that we are literally in the last moments of publishing a brand new website that will have the information better organized for you all. And um, we will be launched early next week. I'm going to give you sort of an early preview of what that website will look like now. Um, and it went, once you go to it, right now, it's it's hosted at a different URL. And so you're not going to find it at bumblebeeatlas.org. But early next week, we will sort of flip the switch and we will put all of the information at bumblebeeatlas.org, allowing you to sort of find all of that. So I'm just going to give you a preview of the website right now and sort of an orientation as to what you'll see when you go there early next week. Of course, we will send out an email to all of you um, next week when the website is published. We will share the URL. We will also share the link to the recording on YouTube and on our website where you can find it. So I'm going to just go ahead and share my screen now and give you um, a, uh, a preview of our Bumblebee Atlas, our new, brand new <laughs> uh, Bumblebee Atlas website. Um, so when you go to the, the brand new website, which currently, if you actually, if you want to preview the website, even before it goes live to the public, you're welcome to visit this URL. I'll drop it in the chat here and you can poke around. Um, the website is still a little bit in beta testing mode here, but you're welcome to go poke around and this will be the actual website once we publish live and what it will look like. You'll notice when you come to the home page of the website um, that there's an there's a Atlas interest form that is linked here. And I would encourage you now, if you're in one of our new regions and you want to join a mailing list, I would encourage you to fill out that form right now. Um, and that will allow you to get on our mailing lists and you'll get our updates about our regional updates about trainings and opportunities and all of that. Um, also from the from the home page here, if you click on contacts, it will take you to our contacts page where you can find um, the contact information, including email addresses and phone numbers for all of the coordinators, most of who are on the um, the website or on this webinar today. Um, but you can find our contact information on this contact page. Um, a couple of folks that are not with us right now are Michelle Toshak. Michelle just started at Xerces a little over a week ago, and she's brand new. She will be coordinating our Montana Bumblebee Atlas project. Molly Martin is also not here today. She couldn't be here. She will help coordinate the Pacific Northwest project moving forward um, with help from me and coordination from me. And then we've also hired a coordinator to run the Atlas project, our new Atlas project in Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, and Nevada. She is um, currently finishing up a school teaching year and she will be joining us in very early June. So about six weeks from now, she'll be new. 
you will likely be hearing from Michelle and I about the Mountain States Bumblebee Atlas between now and then. So um, just stay tuned there. Um, she's a fantastic person and wanted to finish out her job. So we, um, as a teacher, so we've respected that, but we're really excited to have her start in early June. So stay tuned there and we'll be reaching out about resources and that project um, between now and then. Um, you can also just in here explore all the different partners that are engaged in this project. It is it is a large project across more than the lower more than the land area of the lower or of half of the lower 48 states. So a lot of engaged partners and funders um, that are essential to us being able to do this great, great work. Um, once you're sort of oriented and you found your local coordinator, you can click on this Get Involved button here, and this will show you, um, if you click on Find Your Atlas, it'll take you to the local regional atlas um, pages. Um, like if you click on the Southeast here, it'll then take you to specific information about the Southeast Bumblebee Atlas, and you'll be able to find permitting and your local handbook. Um, and other resources that are, are available to you. And so we have this at sort of each of the regions. Um, and if instead of choosing find your atlas, you choose adopt a grid cell, this will take you to our grid cell map where, where you will be able to see um, the different uh, areas of uh, the United States where we have um, Bumblebee Atlas projects will be posting our Montana and Wyoming and, and Colorado, Utah and Nevada grid cells up here very shortly. Um, but if you zoom in here is where you'll see actually the local grid cells and how to get involved in your, your local state. And you scroll down and you can, there will be a, um, a survey here where you'll actually be able to adopt that grid cell. Um, and uh, if you go to events, this is the page where you will learn about upcoming webinars. And if you look at the map, you can actually see areas where we have in-person events. Again, this is still in beta, so these events are still coming. But if you sort of zoom in and you see some of these events in Western Tennessee, you can click on this and it'll bring up details and the date and the time of it. And if you scroll down, you can actually see the registration. And if you click on view, it will take you to um, the registration page for that event and you can register. Um, or if you don't see a registration link there, then you can scroll down to this field training registration page and you can fill out your information here. Once you select the state where you're gonna be doing your, or you wanna attend the field training, it'll bring up the different options here and you can click on that and choose the event that you're registering for, and then just fill out the information and, and you'll be registered and then receive confirmation from your local regional coordinator. On the resources pages here is where you'll find information about permitting, about how to train online, um, about equipment that will be helpful. You can find our data sheets and our handbooks. You can find photography tips here. You can find out information about the survey protocol and then uh, how to identify bumblebees, a tons of resources that are available for you, both online and field, field guides. And then a brand new feature of our website that I think we're really excited about for this year is to join our forums. Um, and if you click on forums here, if you see a blank, it means that you're not logged in. So you're gonna need to create an account on the new website in order to participate in our forums. And the purpose of the forums is, is kind of going to be like all of our current, our groups currently have a private Facebook group where we're having people sort of coordinate and answer each other's questions and maybe find other people to do surveys with. Our forums are going to be the new place for that. And the way to, to, to sort of be able to see those forums would be from the homepage to go to sign up or if you already have an account, you could click choose sign in, which I'll do here. But if you click sign up, you should be able to just use an existing Google or Facebook account or Apple account to just automatically join in here. And so if I click sign in with Google, it'll automatically use my Google account and it will log me into the website. And then when I go to forums here, I can actually see the forums. And then if you want it, so I can enter these forums now, 
and communicate with my local volunteers um, and my local coordinator to help me find answers to questions or potentially areas to, um, to do surveys, et cetera. So you're gonna click in here and then you'll see the discussion board over here on the left-hand side and you'll be able to include spatial information about your question. If you had a question about a specific park that you needed a permit to, you could actually put a, a, a pin to that on the map here and then ask a specific question about it, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, great new feature of the website that again will be coming early next week. Um, and uh, also under this data, um, so um, under, yeah, under the data here, we also are gonna have new features on the website. We currently are building uh, uh, a field guide. So all of the bumblebees that the Atlas ha has identified will, will have profile pages here that'll be data driven. You'll notice, and you've probably already noticed during this webinar that the vast majority of information that we've been talking about in terms of products has been related to the, to the Pacific Northwest. And that's because we're sort of, We've, we've completed at least the first phase of the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas. So the products are out and they're complete and, and we have final sort of products here. But if you click on say Bombus huntii, it'll bring you to you know, an overview of that species. You can see um, the number of, of observations of that species. Currently, this is only the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas, but we'll be adding information um, about all our other atlases eventually as the data keeps coming in. And these are interactive charts. So you can actually zoom in and learn more about what plants the bumblebees are using in, in different regions. Um, and you can sort of select um, different habitat types and it will show you where those surveys were conducted. And so um, lots of really neat data driven information is also gonna be available on the website. And even if you scroll all the way down to the bottom here, you can see an overall dashboard that shows all of the species and all of the host plants that are available. And again, this is interactive. So I can compare again, Bombus huntii to Bombus nevadensis and see where those two species are found on the map. I can see the host plants that they're using. I can zoom in and see what they're using in different areas and see how huntii differs from nevadensis um, and I can also interact with that different habitats that they were found in. So again, really cool new interactive data features that are going to be available on the website. There's a page here about how to submit data on Bumblebee Watch, which is our platform where we gather data for the Atlas. And then if you click on data highlights here, you can see information about all of our Atlas projects, as well as click on one of these to see information about, say, Nebraska. If you wanted to see Nebraska highlights, you can click there and learn about what we've learned in Nebraska over the last several years. Um, we've talked about the forum and about contacts. So that's really a, a pretty quick overview of the new website and where you'll be able to find information for this season moving forward. Um, and yeah, just hope that you will um, engage with us and, and learn more, help us learn more about bumblebees and close some of these information gaps that our team has shared with you today about, about bumblebees and, and how we can better use data to conserve them. Um, and, and I just can't tell you enough how much of a difference the contributions and surveys that you all have been doing across the country have made a difference for bumblebee conservation in North America. We've now engaged, you know, like over 2,000 people in this program across the country and gathered nearly 100,000 survey-driven bumblebee observations that are just helping us learn so much more about these essential species. And, um, you know, we couldn't do it without all of your engagement and help. So please, if we can help you learn more or, or, or do, if we can do a better job getting you more resource, please reach out to your local coordinator you can send an email to bumblebeeatlas at xerces.org and we can we can help you. So thank you all so much for your attention today. I know this was a long webinar, two and a half hours on a Saturday morning or early afternoon is a is a long time, but the vast majority of you stuck around for the whole thing. So so thank you so much for being here today. And on behalf of the entire team, I will just say um, 
bumblebee survey season is started in California and it's getting close in the rest of the country. So um, get excited, get trained, um, find your local event for your local atlas and get out there and start helping us do surveys um, this summer. And uh, thank you so much. Have a great afternoon.